Let's continue our discussion of Jewish history with uh, three lectures, three short lectures that are going to look specifically at the birth of Christianity. This is obviously an incredibly important moment in world history, although if you ask most Jews in the first century, they probably would not have noted the uh, appearance of this movement, which would ultimately change the world uh, because it simply faded into the background of so many other things that were going on at that time. Let's begin first with the discussion of the political background. So as you will recall from the previous lecture, Herod dies in the year 4 before the Common Era. The Romans are not thrilled with the idea of giving his descendants, that is, those who survived his multiple murderous rages, uh, the title of king. So his eldest surviving son, one Archelaus, was given the diminished title ethnarch, which means essentially ruler of the people, but not having nearly as much power as king per se. The real power would be vested in Roman authorities. Now Archelaus was given the most important section of the territory. You can see in this map here, he was given Judea itself, which is more towards the south, and Idumea, the region conquered under the uh, Hashmonaim, uh, and then also Samaria, his mother was actually Samarian, and up until the Galil, the Galilee region. Uh, this was the highest status uh, region of the entire area. It was a mixed population of Jews and non-Jews, primarily Samaritans. His younger brother, Herod Antipas, was given the much more Jewish Galilee region, and the Perea, which is on the uh, eastern bank of the Jordan River. And another younger brother, Herod Philip, was given the region that was more recently conquered uh, in what would be today Syria and Jordan. His uh, Herod's sister, Salome, was given the region on the coast, which included Yamnia, which is uh, in Hebrew tradition known as Yavne, a very important place later on in the first century, and also a little bit of territory on the Jordan River Valley. So that's basically how the territory was divided up. It didn't last Last long, however, because Archelaus was regarded as an unusually cruel and incompetent administrator, and due to a significant amount of uh, local pressure, the Romans decided to simply remove him from rule, and he was exiled to the new settlement of Vienne, which is in the south of France on the Rhone River. It's actually you know, not too bad if you get exiled to uh, south of France, but this was not definitely an ideal place for a Jew to go. He is nevertheless the first named Jew in France uh, in the year 6 before the Common Era. And the Romans put in place uh, Roman administrators who were called at first prefects and then later called procurators. And even when we would have a Jewish king a little bit later in the first century, it was really the prefect or the procurator who would be the person in charge and really having significant power. Two of the most important of these figures were Pontius Pilate, who was extremely important, of course, uh, during the story of Jesus' life and death, and Gessius Florus, who was very important in terms of understanding the background of the revolt that would erupt in the year 66. Now, in terms of the Jewish kings, there were two of them. It was, they were both named Agrippa, also known as Agrippas. The first one, Herod Agrippa I, reigned from the year 41 to 44. And the reason why his kingship was reinstated had less to do with politics in Judea, but more to do with politics in Rome. Uh, he was favored by incoming emperors, and as a result, he was given some territory back. It's a lot of interesting things to say about him as an individual, but I'd just like to focus on two things for our purposes today. Uh, first of all, he appears negatively in the Christian scriptures, which we're going to talk about more in the the next lecture. In the book of Acts chapter 12 in particular, this is the Agrippa that uh, actually does very badly vis-a-vis -vis James and also Peter. However, in the Talmudic tradition, he appears with some frequency as a sadly heroic figure. And uh, this seems to have a significant amount of historical support. He seems to have been sort of a divided character. He was uh, raised as a, a Roman and with Roman sensibilities that is um, not so much in tune with the much more religious sensibilities 
of the population in Jerusalem, and especially not the rural countryside, uh, he would have been much more comfortable in the Roman enclaves of Caesarea, for example. However, he did establish significant connections with the Pharisaic community, and uh, in many ways attempted to, you know, at least um, feign some kind of support for Jewish ideals. Uh, the the Talmud describes an unusual passage in which he uh, is is invited to read from the Torah, and he comes across a passage that essentially describes how he as an Idumean, because he is the grandson of Herod, the Idumean, uh, would be invalidated from being the high priest, and his eyes filled with tears, and the, uh, the, the rabbis in pres who are present say, you are our brother, Agrippas, you are our brother. And for this, incidentally, they were criticized because it was a sort of an obsequious thing to say at the time. Nevertheless, fascinating figure. It will take us too far off to discuss him now. Um, his son, as Marcus Julius Agrippa II, um, also called king, but not of Judea. He was actually given territories that were primarily not Jewish in the region of Syria that I showed you earlier. Um, he actually was a much more slavish imitator of Roman norms than his father. He actually backed the Roman side in the Roman Jewish war and had very little to do with the actual governance of Judea proper. Uh, this remarkable piece of artwork from Vasily Surikov is actually inspired by a passage in the book of Acts, chapters 25 and 26, in which Paul, about whom we'll have a lot more to say in the next couple of lectures, um, was called to appear before Agrippa II. You can see him here on the left, and also the procurator, Porcius Festus. I actually like that name, Porcius. That sounds pretty uh, ironic or maybe perfect for a Roman procurator, and Agrippa II's sister, Berenice, uh, with whom there are all kinds of nasty rumors as well. And uh, it's a fascinating passage in the book of Acts in which Paul is called to explain himself and say something about Christianity. And Agrippa II here comes across as a somewhat ambivalent character, um, not entirely convinced that uh, the way the Christians are being treated is correct. At any rate, that's a very quick look at the prefects and procurators and the uh, brief-lived kings of the region in the first century. Now, the prefects and procurators had to deal with a lot of difficulties with this population. That culminated, of course, in the Great Revolt of the year 66, extended for about six or seven years. Uh, there were, however, previous revolts. There was a significant revolt in the year 6 that seems to have been connected with a census. Jewish culture frowns on taking censuses, and indeed for counting people for any reason, uh, so much so that when uh, you know, a synagogue will convene a quorum for prayer, a so-called minyan in Hebrew, and you'll need 10 adult males in a traditional Orthodox minyan, um, you will never count them by numbers because it's considered inappropriate to count by numbers. You will uh, you know, recite a verse that has 10 words in it or a blessing that has 10 words in it and uh, count people as you say the words. That way you'll know if you have 10 or not. But there was a revolt in the year 6 over one of these censuses. There are reasons when a census, of course, should be taken, and there are men several mentioned in the Torah, but again, outside of our sphere of responsibility for today's lecture. There was also a significant revolt in the year 40 when Caligula, the then emperor shown here, uh, decided that he, a little bit like uh, Antiochus IV, who we talked about a few lectures ago, decided to uh, defile the temple courtyard by erecting a monument to himself, uh, which would be completely out of keeping with Jewish sensibilities. And Jews were getting very, very upset about this. And in fact, even Roman authorities were saying, you know, Caligula, maybe this isn't such a great idea. They were kind of trying to slow walk his erection of a monument to himself. Uh, luckily for the region, he was assassinated, and this put an end 
to this uh, rather strange attempt to put a uh, monument to Caligula in the temple. But we definitely are dealing with a population that is suspicious of Roman activity and definitely distrustful of Romans and ready to revolt over it. Uh, the Romans in particular, as we discussed under Herod the Great uh, about 50 odd years ago, uh, they've set up a base in Caesarea where it's much more amenable to Roman uh, sensibilities. And it is primarily from Caesarea that most of the Roman administrative decrees are uh, promulgated. Uh, one of the most significant of these procurators I mentioned earlier was Pontius Pilate. Here's actually a fascinating stone that was discovered a while ago uh, that actually mentions his name. He's in the second line here. Pilatus is what it shows there. One last thing that's really crucial to understand about this period is that it is a period of phenomenal messianic ferment. We already spoke about the Qumran community and the Dead Sea Scrolls. You got a sense of what some of these strange populations, perhaps Essenes, may have uh, you know, been like and what, what this would have said about the larger society. But what about specifically the Messianic movement associated with early Christianity? So we know, for example, that Josephus, who is our go-to source for the first century, he wrote a, a magnificent work called The Jewish War, which we've described, again, in previous lectures, talked a little bit about who Josephus was as well, um, and another major work called the Jewish Antiquities, which is huge, and he had a lot to say about internal politics in the first century. He describes, for example, a messianic movement led by a so-called Egyptian prophet, probably a Jew from Egypt rather than an ethnically Egyptian individual, who actually got together uh, troops of, of followers to meet him on the Mount of Olives, and there his uh, messianic movement was crushed. This is probably in the 40s. But what does he say about Jesus? So we have a passage in Josephus's writings, which is called the Testimonium Flavianum. Uh, Flavianum meaning from Flavian, the uh, dynasty of emperors that adopted Josephus. His name was formerly uh, Flavius Josephus, so hence the, the name Flavianum. And this is a really bizarre and much argued about passage. Here's, here's a translation of it. Um, and just reading the first part, about this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man. Somewhat bizarre thing for a Jew like Josephus to write. The idea of a human being uh, possessing the qualities or attributes of God in a identical sense, meaning that this is a God-man, would be very unusual for a Jew to say, and still remain within the parameters of Judaism uh, of the first century, especially towards the end of it, when we'll talk about how there was a more of a split between church and synagogue, and this was made absolutely clear for the synagogue community that it was totally verboten. Um, and then some description on it. And then this passage, he was the Messiah, like Wow, that is like the end of the story. I mean, in Jewish thought, a Messiah, the word in Hebrew is Mashiach, it's translated into Greek as Christos. It means essentially the anointed one, right? Like pouring oil on the head of this one being chosen to lead the Jews. We see that passage, for example, in the book of Samuel, where um, uh, the prophet Samuel anoints Saul. This is the, the term Christos, Messiah, Mashiach. Now, Many scholars have doubted for hundreds of years that this particular paragraph was actually written by Josephus. In recent decades, there's been some revision of that saying, well, maybe Josephus wrote something that was later edited by an enthusiastic Christian copyist because some elements of it seem to be, you know, um, acceptable for a Greek writing Jew of the first century to write, but others just seem so far out of line, such as this phrase, he was the Messiah. I mean, if, if he was the Messiah in Jewish thought, history stops at that point, right? He's a king, he takes over the population and creates Jewish independence, both spiritually and politically, and that obviously didn't happen. It would be strange for Josephus to write that. 
and, and so on and so forth. So many have opined, and it seems like the balance of scholarly opinion is that this particular passage is not uh, really Josephus' writings. The first time it appears in a corroborating quotation is in the work of Eusebius, a church historian from the late 3rd, early 4th century. And so most scholars assume that this particular passage was somehow inserted between Josephus' death at the end of the 1st century and the time that Eusebius saw it a couple hundred years later. But at any rate, uh, what I can say in this context is that we don't have any other corroborating information outside of Christian sources that gives a sense of what Jews at that time actually thought about the early Christian movement. We will have some discussion that appears later um, towards the end of the first century and certainly going into the third century. We'll talk in a couple of lectures about how the Talmud describes the separation of church and synagogue and how the synagogue looks backward upon the events that became so important for the emerging Christian movement. But at the time, they did not really make a ripple in the few Jewish sources that we have. At any rate, a lot more to say about this. Uh, let us continue with the next lecture where we're going to look specifically at uh, Jesus within the larger context of his Jewish audience. Thank you very much for watching.